My name is Matt DeVoe and I am the CEO and co-founder of UDA LLC. Bob and I started a conference, Bob Gorley, the co-founder of UDA and myself, back in 2010 called Fed Cyber. And we saw that there was a distinct disconnect between the conversations around cybersecurity that were happening in the federal government and in the private sector. And so we built an agenda of events that actually brought those communities together and, and kind of got them on the same page or got them sharing information. And we ran that for over five years very successfully. But then there's a point in time where you kind of say like, okay, mission accomplished. And do you continue to run the conference just for the sake of running the conference? Right? A, a big fan of Annie Duke's book, Quit, right? There are some times when you have to just say like, okay, we accomplished our objective, kind of let, let's stop. And so we stopped and we contemplated and we decided that the next iteration was not to focus on cybersecurity, but let's focus on this exponential technology disruption that's taking place. AI, quantum computing, autonomous systems, uh, the emerging space economy, biomedicine, right? There was just this eclectic group of topics that were going to have a great impact on the future that also have a geopolitical element, a cybersecurity element. So we decided to build a community of interest to demonstrate tremendous curiosity around those topics and bringing a community together to discuss and to learn and to explore and to hypothesize what the future might look like and how we should all be thinking about it. We've noticed that the trends that we were talking about by way of emergent technologies have, have come true. Uh, right? Talking about AI prior to chat GPT, right? talking about the impact of quantum computing, uh, all of those things that we predicted would be top of mind and would be hugely impactful have become top of mind and hugely impactful. Almost every conversation today uh, has touched on AI in some capacity. But four years ago, it was difficult to get a conversation sparked around that topic you know, in particular. Uh, so I think we've done a great job uh, discussing those types of technology disruption issues. On the geopolitical landscape, we've had some real honest and transparent discussions around Russia aggression towards Ukraine, uh, other topics where it is proven to be true, right? Where the, it, it's the, the world has kind of fallen into that framework that we established around continued Russian aggression and the direct impact on Ukraine. So the geopolitical element, the uh, role that China is playing with regards to trying to get their technology embedded in all of these developing nations. And we heard uh, multiple instances this morning of where that's actually coming true, right? Which was a risk that we were talking about at Udukan. And at the broader level, you know, we have acknowledged things, what we, we got something we talked about a few years ago called binary fractures, where we said like it's becoming increasingly polarized around all of these topics, especially in politics, that is disadvantageous because we move to the extremes and it removes the dialogue in the middle. And the dialogue in the middle is usually the path forward, the compromise, the thinking about the opportunity of AI without, uh, while also managing the risk as opposed to thinking AI is opportunity only or AI is risk only. Uh, and that was reflective of trends that we saw just in the general political landscape and was starting to impact the technology uh, and some of the cybersecurity and geopolitical risk conversations as well. This year's theme was all about convergence. So we've looked at these technologies in isolation and their incredible disruptive potential, right? We, we call it exponential disruption. Uh, and we talked last year around how, as human beings, we're really not well equipped to think about exponentials. If I ask you to double in size for 64 times, how big a number is that, right? Like I shared on stage the story around the parable of the invention of chess, where you have a king who's bored and wants new games, and this peasant comes and says, hey, uh, I have this game chess that I've invented and the king loves it. And he says, I love this, name your reward. I'll give you anything in my kingdom. And the peasant says, well, I'll just take one grain of rice in the first square of the chessboard, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and double every time. And the king's like, oh my God, I can't believe I got this game of chess for so cheap. Uh, his reward is just gonna be a pile of rice. But if you do the math, that is larger than the rice production, the modern economy combined for like 70 years, right? Like it's a huge amount of rice. That's the power of exponentials. So we spent a lot of time over the past couple of years getting people to understand we're not equipped under, to, to comprehend exponentials as a species, yet that's the environment we're in with technology. 
And then also highlighting the fact that the exponential for something like AI didn't start with the release of ChatGPT. It started in the 1980s. So we're already on the back half of the chessboard. So the incremental increase from this square to the next square next year is hugely incomprehensible and very disruptive. So with that as the framework around what you know, exponential technologies mean in isolation, this year we wanted to mash them up. We wanted to say, okay, if we think about the exponential disruptive technology of AI and then the exponential disruptive technology of biomedicine, genetic medicines, genetic therapies, what if the two combine? What if AI is able to supplement what scientists have traditionally tried to do manually and now all of a sudden you have the automa you know, automated uh, computation of these potential therapies or the automated mapping of uh, particular gene mutations that can help counter a particular disease. Those are the types of things that we're now trying to get the community to focus on is okay, let's take the technologies out of isolation and let's converge them because we see that as the next thing that's going to be hugely impactful for this community. We like to think that the issues that we're dealing with at this event transcend politics, especially domestic politics. I've been working uh, cybersecurity you know, and risk portfolio for over 30 years, including working with the government. I've worked with every administration, Republican, Democrat, like the issues transcend the politics. We have to deal with them. But it certainly serves as a backdrop for the geopolitical, for the regulatory. You know, one thing we talked about last year a lot was uh, this, you know, decontrol or remove the regulations on some of these innovative technologies to keep pace uh, with uh, our potential competitors and adversaries. Certainly, I think there's folks that are thinking, okay, we're going to enter into an environment of decontrol. Uh, certainly, there are things that uh, uh, individuals that feel like there's going to be a huge impact from a withdrawal of support from Ukraine and a potential impact on NATO and the geopolitical instability associated with that. So there's the backdrop. But you know, we try and transcend it uh, for the most part when we talk about the disruptive technologies. Uh, I, I uh, ignorantly thought that we would get into today not knowing the outcome of the election. So I thought it would be something we wouldn't have to address, but inevitably we wound up with that as the backdrop. And I think it is on people's mind in that context. Uh, and of course, when we talk about binary fractures, our original thinking around binary fractures was focused on the US political system. And then we saw it expanding into some of the international political systems where we really feared for the polarization. You know, uh, when you think of things in a binary context, it's a one or a zero, it's an on or it's off. It's really dangerous to think about governance about technology in terms of a one or a zero, a yes or a no, right? Like it, it usually involves thinking through things a little bit more holistically. So that trend line in of itself, you know, uh, was disconcerting overall. In my opening remarks today, I talked about like, well, we always tend to think of these extremes, like biomedicine is going to cure disease or is it going to be used as a bioweapon? And it's like, we can work where we build an environment where we drive the innovation to cure the disease while also minimizing the risk of it being used as, as a bioweapon. Right now on stage, they literally are talking about whether AI will provide more value to hackers trying to attack things or defenders trying to defend them. Uh, it's not binary, right? It's going to help both sides. And then it's a matter of like, okay, how can we invest money to improve our collective defense or to give uh, us a, a, you know, a strategy or a capability that helps us deter the, the bad use of AI. So th those, uh, the binary fractures are hugely impactful to the conversations that we have and the innovation that exists. And that's why we've identified it as a trend line that we need to work through as a community. Uh, this morning, a bit about uh, something that we call uh, Schrodinger's mental model. Uh, if you're familiar with the, you know, the uh, Schrodinger's cat, where mm -hmm. you know, the cat is both alive and dead. And this duality, uh, especially in the context of uh, not being able to accurately predict the future of maintaining multiple mental models at once, peace and prosperity and conflict. China is a great example of that. There are pathways towards which there could be great peace and prosperity, uh, you know, continued economic interdependence, so, you know, a great global trade. And then there are scenarios where it is uh, conflict and there's a uh, taking of Taiwan and the economic, you know, sanctions and the military escalation associated with that. So 
that was another uh, kind of area that we talked about the necessity as a decision maker that you kind of have to maintain both models in your head because we don't know which is going to come true and you have to plan uh, for each of those. Uh, so that I think is, is a fascinating discussion that we're having in the community right now. Um, the, the issues around uh, control uh, over technology have been emergent throughout the day, finding that balance on how do you regulate a technology like AI that doesn't give up the technology advantage to a competitor overseas, but allows us to deploy these technologies without them becoming unsafe or harmful to ourselves. Uh, another uh, key theme is uh, a discussion around the emergence of uh, self-sovereignty over our own data uh, and over our own lives and a movement affiliated with that towards building states that, would, that are described as network states that are not affiliated with the current existing nation state infrastructure. What does it look like? And we used as the backdrop $550 million raised a couple of weeks ago for this entity called Praxis, which is going to build a physical network state, new laws, new pathways towards innovation, uh, really the emergence of a new form of nation state that we haven't seen you know, for at least multiple decades, uh, but focused on technology innovation, digital self-sovereignty, the use of advanced tool, economic tools like blockchain and cryptocurrency, uh, a, a reduction uh, in the overhead associated with services that the state provides to the citizens. So uh, very, very interesting conversations. It was stuff that we talked about 30 years ago as being science fiction. And now we see the manifestation of it uh, where I can get digital citizenship in another country right now where you have entities creating um, autonomous zones as it relates to uh, the legal environment. And then you have something like Praxis raising $550 million to go and create a new city that has geographical land mass you know, associated with it. Coupled with that becomes the discussion of what does power look like in the future? We always think a new nation state or autonomous entity can't arise because military power dominates the day unless they have an army, which requires a lot of taxes and access to technology. They're not going to be global players, but technology disrupts that. What if they've got a, a, a general AI, right? A general intelligence associated with them. What if they have an advanced cybersecurity capability where they're like, if you come in with your tanks, we're going to take down your power grid. What if they have a bioweapon as a deterrent where they're like, just leave us alone to be autonomous or else we break the vials. And, you know, there's this, this uh, element to that. So thinking through those hard issues, again, it sounds very much like science fiction or something out of a novel, but they're the realities that we're going to be confronted with in the near future. So trying to provoke the thought and the dialogue around those contingencies and those issues is important for us.